Hello, my name is Manjiri Dighe. I'm an associate professor from the University of Washington in Seattle. And the topic of my lecture today is imaging of abnormal placentation. In this lecture, I'll be describing what a normal placenta looks like and then uh, imaging findings in uh, abnormalities of the placenta as well. Placenta is a central support organ for the developing fetus, serving as the site of maternal fetal exchange of oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nut nutrition. Ultrasound is the primary imaging tool for the placenta, but MR is used primarily as an adjunct imaging tool. So in this lecture, we will review the normal sonographic appearance of placenta, review anatomic variants, abnormal placentation cases, and then look at an approach to selected anomalies with preferred imaging modality. So in imaging the placenta, we will look at the location, the shape and the number, the uh, abnormalities of cord origin, placental grading, placental thickness and morphology as well. Placenta can be identified as early as six weeks by transvaginal ultrasound and 10 weeks by transabdominal ultrasound. It is seen as an area of focal thickening of hyperechoic rim of tissue around the gestational sac and distinct from the myometrium. From 12 to 13 weeks, color flow should, uh, Doppler evaluation can show intervigilous blood flow. And by 14 or 15 weeks, the placenta is well formed and can be seen easily. The retroplacental complex is a prominent hypoechoic area composed of desidua, myometrium and uterine vessels and this should never be greater than one to two centimeters in thickness. The red outlines the retroplacental complex in this particular patient. Placenta is graded uh, using the Granum classification. Grade zero is placental, placenta, which is homogeneous. The um, chore amniochorionic plate is even throughout in this and usually seen in the late first trimester or early second trimester. Grade one placenta is when a few echogenic densities are seen ranging from two to three millimeters in diameter. The chorionic plate shows small indentations and is seen in the mid second and early third trimester. Grade two placenta is when the chorionic plate shows marked indentations appearing as comma-like densities which extend into the placental substance but does not reach the basal plate. The echogenic densities also are um, more in number compared to a grade one placenta. The basal layer also becomes punctuated with linear echoes which are enlarged with their long axis parallel to the basal layer. This is seen in the late third trimester, usually about 30 weeks to delivery. Grade three placenta is seen when there's complete indentations of the chorionic plate through to the basilar plate creating cotyledons. And this is seen in third, uh, 39 weeks to post dates. The vast majority of hypoechoic foci in the placenta are intervelous space thrombi or desidual septal cyst, commonly referred to as placental lakes. The term placental lakes also refers to intervelous vascular spaces that appear hypoechoic and demonstrate low velocity laminar flow on color Doppler images. Uh, desidual septal cysts are related to focal degeneration within the maternal desidual septa. And most intervelous space thrombi and desidual septal cysts are 1 to 2 centimeters in size and are, a limited, and are of limited clinical significance. True placental cysts occur on the, placental fetal, on the fetal surface of the placenta, typically near the cord insertion and appear to develop at the subchorionic foci of fibrin deposition. Majority are simple with internal echogenicity identical to that of amniotic fluid. As seen in this particular case with the cyst seen adjacent to the fetal uh, long bones and the cyst seen on the placental surface or the fetal surface of the placenta on the uh, gross specimen. The prevalence of placental cyst is thought to be in the range of 2 to 7 percent, but most are small and usually not noticed. Now we shall look at abnormalities of placental shape. Succentured lobe or accessory placental lobe is seen when there is fetal vessels traversing between the lobes 
as seen in this particular explanted gross specimen with a small placental accessory placenta seen here and fetal vessels seen in between. This is represented in the diagram over here with the main placental bulk and then vessels coursing in between uh, membranes to the smaller placental tissue. The fetal vessels can also, these fetal vessels can also seen to cross the internal os, in which case it would be a vasa previa. Color Doppler is used to show these placental, uh, these vessels. As seen on this particular case over here, these vessels are not seen well on the B mode image, but are seen well on the color Doppler. The succensurate lobe carries an increased risk of retained products of conception and hence um, needs to be diagnosed intrauterine. A bilobe placenta is a variant of succensurate lobe. In this, the two lobes are equal in size with the cord origin in between the two lobes. There's usually a thin bridge of tissue in between, as seen in this particular case, with two equal placentas seen anteriorly and posteriorly, and fetal vessels seen coursing in between, and the cord origin seen in between these two placental lobes. Moving on to abnormalities of attachment. Velamentous cord origin is seen when the cord originates adjacent to the placenta from the membranes. Seen in this particular uh, gross specimen, this is a placental tissue, fetal membranes, and the cord is seen to originate at the edge of the fetal membranes. Um, on this image with the light shining through in the, in the back, you can see the vessels pretty well within the uh, membranes as well. Color Doppler is used to find the cord origin in all these cases. And so, in this particular case, you can see the placental tissue anteriorly, membranes running in between, uh, the cord vessels running in between the membranes and the cord originating out along the lateral edge of the uterine, uterine wall. These cord vessels lack placental support and hence there's an increased risk of IUGR, preterm labor, cord thrombosis or cord rupture at delivery. This can result in twin-twin transfusion in twins as well. Vasa previa is seen when there's um, abnormal fetal vessels within the amniotic membranes that cross the internal os. There is risk of rupture when the supporting membranes rupture and these abnormal vessels either connect a velamentous cord insertion with the main body of the placenta or connect portions of the bilobe placenta or a placenta with the succinctuariate lobe. Doppler ultrasound is used to demonstrate flow within vessels overlying the internal os as seen in this particular case. This is the cervix with the internal os, and here's a placenta with the vessels crossing the uh, os, suggesting a vasa previa. Transvaginal ultrasound may be necessary to diagnose uh, vasa previa, as seen in this particular case. Um, the cord origin was seen further up. There was a uh, succensurate lobe, and transvaginal ultrasound shows vessels crossing the internal os in this particular case, suggesting vasa previa. Marginal cord origin, also known as battledore placenta, is when an eccentric cord, there's eccentric cord insertion on the placenta within 20 millimeters of the edge. Seen in this particular case, placental tissue anteriorly and the cord originates at the ed edge of the placenta. Similarly, color Doppler shows a similar thing with the cord originating at the edge and in, the, in this particular case. Color Doppler, as I mentioned, is necessary to evaluate for the cord origin and this is usually, um, marginal cord origin usually does not have any morbidity associated with it. Circumvalid placenta is when uh, placental membranes attach to the fetal surface of the placenta. As seen in this diagrammatic representation, a normal uh, membrane inserts at the edge of the placenta. In a circumvalid placenta, the edge traverses over the placenta for a distance uh, and then attaches to the placenta. This margin can become fibrosed and appear echogenic on ultrasound. Uh, this can result in bleeding, PPROM, or premature rupture of membranes, IUGR, and preterm labor as well. The placenta migrates 5 mm per week, and in previa, the placenta, uh, placental edge is close to the internal os. Previa can be diagnosed in second trimester and can also resolve by third trimester. There are different classifications of placenta previa. Complete previa is when it completely covers the internal os, as seen in this particular diagrammatic representation. Partial previa is seen when it partially covers the os. 
marginal previa is seen within its when it's within two centimeters of the internal os. There's an increased risk of um, increased risk of placenta previa with increasing age um, and increasing parity as well. Five percent of these placenta previas are associated with accretors and percretors and may need transvaginal ultrasound or translabial ultrasound for confirmation. This is a case of complete placenta previa. Here's the cervix with the internal os and the placenta sitting on top of the cervix and the internal os. So this is a case of placenta, complete placenta previa, cervix with the placenta sitting on top of the internal os, a partial placenta previa where the placenta partially covers the internal os, which is represented by these calipers, and then a marginal previa where the placenta just touches the internal os but does not cross it. The uh, transvaginal ultrasound is used in uh, assessing placenta previa and based on this particular uh, study from obstetric gynecology in 1990, they had 100 patients with suspected placenta previa who had transvaginal ultrasound. 99 had the diagnosis confirmed on cesarean section and transvaginal ultrasound had a sensitivity of 87.5%, 87 .87 specificity of about 99%, positive predictive value of 93% and negative predictive value of 98%. They also found that transvaginal ultrasound was not associated with increased bleeding when performed during ongoing vaginal hemorrhage. Transperineal or translabial ultrasound can also be performed if transvaginal ultrasound is, is, is difficult to perform. In another study from um, obstetric gynecology in 1997, um, they've, based on a prospective cohort, they had 130 131 patients with suspected placenta previa or low-lying pa uh, placentas greater than 15 weeks of gestation who had both transabdominal and transvaginal ultrasound for detection of placental location. 66 women of these had suboptimal visualization by transabdominal only and 65 women needed uh, had adequate visualization but with, with both transabdominal and transvaginal ultrasound. 48 of these cases were confirmed by transvaginal ultrasound with 25 being low-lying and 23 being marginal. Uh, 17 cases had were reclassified after the transvaginal ultrasound with the placental location change uh, but not changing the diagnosis. So based on this, um, they, they suggested that the transvaginal ultrasound may result in reclassification of placenta previa and hence if uh, if the placenta is low-lying or if the fetal head is in the, in the view, transvaginal ultrasound is necessary for further analysis. This is a representative case showing a fetus with the head overlying the internal os. This is the cervix. It is very difficult to see the internal os because of the fetal head and the bladder. A transvaginal ultrasound was performed. Even with the transvaginal ultrasound, you can see the placental, placenta posteriorly. However, the placental edge is difficult to evaluate due to the fetal head. After ma uh, gradual and um, manual, manually displacing the fetal head, you can see that the fluid, um, with the fluid interspersed in between the fetal head and the internal os, it is now easier to visualize the internal os. With color Doppler, no um, vessels or placental tissue was seen overlying the internal loss, and the distance to the placental edge was about 1.7 centimeters, classifying this as a low-lying placenta and not a placenta previa. MR can be used for further evaluation of suspected placenta previa cases, especially if the lower edge is difficult to discern. This is a patient with a complete previa. You can see the placenta overlying the internal loss completely. Patient with partial placenta previa, here's the cervix with the internal os and part of the placenta overlying the internal os and a patient with a marginal uh, placenta previa with the internal os um, seen here and the placenta just touching the internal os. Some of, these, some of the placentas can also undergo abnormal attachment and uh, uh, result in accretors, increters or percretors. These result from defect in the normal desura basalis from either prior surgery or instrumentation and allow for the abnormal adherence of the placenta and penetration into the chorionic villi and sometimes into the uterine wall as well. They are associated with high morbidity from maternal bleeding of almost 90% and require transfusion with a 7% mortality and a 15% chance of uterine rupture with percretors. 
So accretas are seen most commonly in about 80% of cases when there is superficial invasion of the basalis layer. In creators, when there is invasion into the uterine wall but not, throughout, not beyond the uterine wall, seen in about 15% and percretors seen in about 5% of cases when there is involvement of surrounding serosa or adjacent organs. Sonographic features of placenta accreta include loss of normal retroplacental clear space, anomalies of the bladder myometrium interface, prominent placental lacunae, and increased vascularity at the interface of the uterus and the bladder. Of these, the prominent placental lacunae have the highest positive predictive value. Lacunae are characterized by ill-defined margins and irregular shape and show turbulent flow on color Doppler. The overall sensitivity and specificity of ultrasound for diagnosis of placenta accreta has been reported to be about 77 to 93% and 71 to 96% respectively. Placenta accreta can be difficult to diagnose on ultrasound but can be seen as thinning of the uterine wall as seen in this particular case with um, abnormal, abnormal vascularity which was not readily visualized in this particular case. These are difficult to diagnose prenatally and may be easily missed. Placenta increters, when there is invasion of the uterine wall, is seen as areas of increased vascularity as seen on this color Doppler image with areas of lacunae formation seen in this particular case. Placenta percreta is when there is invasion of surrounding organs and invasion of the uterine wall all throughout. These can be seen in this particular case where there is interface with the bladder is lost and you can see placental tissue extending outwards along the anterior part of the placenta. MR has been used to evaluate for placental invasion and it's most useful in cases where the sonographic findings are equivocal or when the placenta has a posterior location. MR findings of placenta, uh, placenta accreta include abnormal uterine bulging, heterogeneous placental signal intensity on T2-weighted images and presence of dark intraplacental bands related to the lacunae on the T2-weighted images. The overall sensitivity and specificity of MR is about in the high 80s and between 65 and 100 percent respectively. So in this case you can see um, invasion of the anterior abdominal wall seen here as loss of the in, uh, myometrial low signal intensity with extension of the placenta outwards. This is a patient with the placenta percreta seen as lateral extension of the placenta into the uh, lateral uh, uh, pelvic organs and broad ligament. Given the difficulty in making an accurate di antipartum diagnosis of placenta accreta, some authors recommend a two-stage approach, beginning with ultrasound in patients with clinical risk factors and then proceeding to MR for equivocal cases. This particular patient shows an, uh, a placenta percreta seen as areas of lacunae formation involving not only the lower uterine wall but also the cervix with increased vascularity seen on color Doppler and then MR confirming the findings seen as areas of heterogeneous signal intensity within the, within the placenta and the myometrium and lateral and posterior extension seen here on these images on the axial and sagittal images. Now we'll evaluate some causes of hemorrhage uh, with placenta being the culprit. Placental abruption. Placental abruption is seen when there is premature sep separation of placenta from the uterine wall. There is increased risk of preterm delivery and fetal death in these cases. Small placental abruptions have excellent prognosis. Larger ones which are greater than 50% in size have poorer prognosis. If the fetus has bradycardia that is associated with poor prognosis as well. And they are most commonly seen in placentas that have marginal or eccentric origin of the cord. Other types of placental abruption include retroplacental and preplacental hemorrhages. Retroplacental is seen behind the placenta and is the most worrisome because of devascularization of the placenta. Preplacental hemorrhages are seen on the surface of the placenta. This is an example of a preplacental abruption with a large uh, fluid collection seen anterior to the placenta. Um, in a chronic placental abruption, uh, septations and um, areas of nodularity can be seen within this fluid collection suggesting a chronic appearance. This is a patient with an old retroplacental abruption seen as an area of avascular fluid collection behind the placenta. CT has been used for evaluation of placental abruption mainly in patients with trauma 
and these can be seen as areas of devascularization if contrast is administered or areas of hemorrhage within the placenta. Seen in this particular case with areas of devascularization and then high density areas suggesting hemorrhage within the placenta. Placental hematomas are well circumscribed masses and their echogenicity varies according to the age. They can occur on the preplacental or subchorionic side or the maternal retroplacental side or be within the placenta as well. They may be hypoechoic or anechoic in the acute phase, heterogeneously echogenic in the subacute phase, and anechoic in the chronic phase. Doppler should reveal absence of blood flow within the um, area of hemorrhage, as seen in this particular case with the heterogeneous collection within the placenta with no flow on color Doppler. Moving on to abnormalities of size and masses within the placenta. The placenta should not be thicker than 4 cm in size and the placenta grows at about 1 mm per week. Normal thickness is equal roughly to the gestational age in millimeters. Placental enlargement or placentomegaly is a non-specific finding and can be seen with maternal or fetal abnormalities. They can be associated with IUGR, high drops or macrosomia. There is an increased risk of placental insufficiency regardless of cause. This is a patient who had a placenta that was 7.6 cm in thickness and obviously thickened or increased in size. Placental masses chorioangiomas are benign retroplacental hemangiomas. They arise on the fetal portion of the placenta and are supplied by the fetal circulation. They are well circumscribed, homogeneous, hypoechoic or mixed, mixed echogenicity masses protruding from the fetal side of the placenta. Most are located near the cord insertion and Doppler does reveal substantial vascularity or large feeding vessels. They could be solitary but could be multiple as well and are associated with increased AFP levels. They can cause polyhydramnios and high drops in, the, in these patients. Um, Follow-up of these patients for evaluation of high drops is important due to their high vascularity. This is an example of a chorioangioma with a heterogeneous mass seen along the fetal surface of the placenta with increased vascularity seen on color Doppler. Pathology specimen shows a, a, a heterogeneous mass seen near the cord insertion in this particular case. Another case with a chorioangioma shows increased vascularity within the mass seen on this particular image with a heterogeneous appearance which may be due to internal hemorrhage as well. Moving on to the gestational trophoblastic tumors, um, the classification suggests either hydatidiform moles, invasive moles and choriocarcinomas and the hydatidiform moles could be complete or partial. So hydatidiform moles are two major types as we said, complete or partial. Complete is due to fertilization of an empty ovum with subsequent duplication of the paternal chromosomes 46XX or 46XY. Ultrasound in a complete uh, uh, mole shows a heterogeneous echogenic endometrial mass with multiple variably sized small anechoic cysts giving the appearance of a snowstorm. There is no identifiable fetal tissue in these cases and color Doppler shows increased vascularity with low resistance waveforms um, seen within the spiral arteries of the uterus. Theca lutein cyst can be seen in about 50% of complete moles and are caused by hyperstimulation of the ovaries due to the excessive production of beta HCG by the abnormal trophoblastic tissue. This is a patient with a, a hired, complete hydatidiform mole with an enlarged um, ovary see, showing multiple cysts suggesting theca lutein cyst. Another case of complete hydatidiform mole showing the snowstorm appearance within the uterus and the MR showing increased signal intensity within this tissue on uh, T2 weighted images with heterogeneous vascularity seen on um, post uh, contrast images. Partial hydatidiform mole is seen when there is fertilization of a normal ovum by two sperms giving 69XXX or 69XXY abnormality. Ultrasound shows a similar appearance to complete moles but are differentiated by the presence of fetal tissue. Seen in this particular case when the placenta is thickened with multiple cysts within it but in addition placental tissue or fetal tissue seen as fetal parts here are seen within this patient as well. MR can be used to determine the extension of the uh, molar tissue to the myometrium outside the uterus. MR findings are frequently nonspecific and can mimic retained products of conception. 
They appear as heterogeneous tissue distending the uterine cavity with predominantly low signal intensity on T1 weighted images, high signal intensity on T2 weighted images, and avid enhancement on post contrast images. Focal areas of hemorrhages and cystic spaces can see, when be seen as well. In partial moles, abnormal fit field tissue can be seen. It is important to identify normal myometrium in these cases, which appears as a hypointense layer surrounding the molar tissue, as this helps in differentiating between uh, invasive and non invasive disease. Invasive mole is seen when there is deep growth of abnormal tissue into and beyond the myometrium, sometimes penetrating into the peritoneum and parametrium. This is a case of a 34-year-old female with rising serum beta HCG after complete evalu evacuation of a complete molar pregnancy. Heterogeneous tissue was seen within the uterus with increased vascularity. MR was performed which showed um, heterogeneous tissue extending through the C-section scar uh, Caesarean section was performed several years previously and there is no evidence of involvement of the surrounding uh, bladder wall. However, on the coronal oblique images, you can see the extension of the tissue out into the parametrium with increased vascularity seen as signal voids in this particular case. This is a 20-year-old um, who had an invasive mole uh, after three months after an abortion. Coronal oblique T2-weighted images demonstrate heterogeneous hemor areas of hemorrhage within the tissue, um, expanding the endometrial cavity. Myometrial invasion is noted along the uh, left lateral wall and anteriorly seen here with disruption of the junctional zone. There is no evidence of extra uterine extension of disease in this particular case. Choriocarcinomas are similar to invasive moles but are capable of metastasizing frequently manifesting as lung and uh, pelvic metastasis. Approximately 50% arise after a molar pregnancy, 25% after abortion, and 25% after a normal pregnancy. MR imaging can have a role in de demonstrating myometrial and parametrial invasion. Choriocarcinoma is usually seen as a intrauterine mass with heterogeneous signal intensity on T2-weighted images and marked enhancement on post-contrast images findings that reflect high vascularity in these cases. Tumor vascularity can also be reflected by um, focal uh, signal voids seen within or uh, on the T1 and T2 weighted images. Myometrial invasion is seen as high signal intensity foci within the myometrium which demonstrate enhancement on post contrast images seen in this particular case along the posterior myometrium. Enhancing parametrial soft tissue is characteristic of local spread. Uh, MR imaging may help detect metastatic disease, particularly in pelvic organs and lymph nodes as well. This patient had a choriocarcinoma extending along the lateral pelvic wall seen as enhancing tissue along the right lateral pelvic wall. This is a patient with metastasis to the lungs. Um, patient, um, the uterine disease was absent with nothing seen within the uterus on MR but the lungs showed multiple nodules suggesting metastasis. So in conclusion, abnormalities of the placenta are important to recognize due to the potential for maternal and fetal morbidity and mortality. Ultrasound is the dominant imaging modality for evaluation of the placenta. MR can be used for invasive placental processes. CT has limited role and is mainly used in trauma and gestational trophoblastic disease. Thank you very much.